Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us. It is Victoria Randall with the CNA Instructor's Secret Cocktail. And um, today we are meeting to give you some great information about resources for CNA instructors to increase the pass rate for the skills exam. Um, I feel that this is a very, very important topic because skills tend to be a part, um, a part of the exam that many students tend to struggle with. And I think it is very, very important to ensure that instructors are equipped with the necessary tools that they need in order to help give the students the push that they need to pass the exam, right? So um, for all of you that are here, um, please, by all means, introduce yourself, kind of say hi and tell us where you're from. We would love to know what state you're from. Um, and I'm assuming many of you are instructors, some of you may be owners. So if you're an owner versus an instructor, please feel free to note that as well. So um, a little bit about me quickly. I'm Victoria Randall. Again, I own the CNA Instructor Secret Cocktail and I consult to help start CNA schools in all 50 states. Um, in addition to consulting to actually start the CNA schools, I feel it's important to also give in instructors and owners all of the things they need to make sure that that business is successful. So that is the purpose of tonight's webinar and we do webinars like this once a month, all right? Um, many, many times we do webinars like this for our CNA school business building course uh, mentorship program that we do, which is a virtual course for individuals who are looking to start their own CNA schools. Um, let's see here real quick. We have Melissa from Georgia. Hi, Melissa. Wendy from South Carolina. Hey, Sade is here as always. Thank you. Uh, we have Key Randall from Hills, Texas. All right. So thank you guys so much for joining. I'm going to um, hand it over to Vicki. So this is Vicki Castillo, and she is the owner of Facets Training. Oh, okay, sorry, somebody just popped up on my screen. Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, I'm going to uh, hand this on over to Vicki Castillo because she's going to give you all that great information I was just telling you guys about. Um, I'll be answering any questions in the chat if you have them, so feel free to post questions as we go along. Um, at the end, there will be a Q&A session, so I really urge you that if it's a general question, to hold that until the end, okay? Uh, Vicki, take it away. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Greetings from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm so happy to see you all, and it's such an honor that you've taken time out of your, your Sunday to, to join Victoria and I. And we are really excited to bring this information to you because it's so valuable. And sometimes we feel that there just isn't enough out there for CNAs to, um, to support us, to help us, to help the students. And so we uh, wanted to share our knowledge with you and hopefully it will be a value, not just for yourself. No volume, huh? Okay, let's see here. Let me see what I can do about the volume. Is else having a problem hearing Vicky? If you're having a problem hearing Vicky, please press the number one. If you're having a problem hearing Vicky talk, press number one for me. Okay, it looks like it may only be you, Juanita. Everyone else is having, can hear. Um, let's try to work on that on your end, okay? Um, there should be a button when you very first come in that allows you to test. Juanita, I would ask that you exit back out and then come back in um, and test all of your sound before you enter in, okay? But it looks like everyone else can hear. All right, go right ahead, Vicki. All right, thank you. Thank you. Let us know how we can help, Juanita. Um, keep putting information in there, and Victoria will be, um, will be chatting back and forth with you to, uh, to see if she can help you out. All right, so again, thanks for being here. And just a little bit about myself, I am the president and founder of Facets Healthcare Training. We are headquartered in Phoenix, Arizona, and I have uh, been an RN for 32 years, about 10 years of that as a CNA instructor. And I also have been an RN test evaluator for the test vendor, CNA test vendor headmaster for about 10 years. And then also I was a RN evaluator for Pearson View as well uh, for some time when I was uh, living in Las Vegas as well. And, um, and so I've been a program coordinator and an instructor, clinical instructor, lab instructor, lecture instructor. And uh, so I felt that with 
the knowledge that I had, I felt it was important to be able to provide some resources for in, individual in, instructors and also for students as well. Um, if you think about it, there are uh, past, um, let's see, pr test prep for CNA, for RN students, there's lots of them available. What, half dozen, maybe eight, 10 organizations that provide test prep for RN students, the same for LPN students, but almost nothing for CNA students. And we know the importance that CNAs play uh, in, in as part of the healthcare team. So I just felt that um, something needed to be done. So I went ahead and, and uh, with a lot of struggle and my fa family support helped me launch this uh, CNA test prep, Facet CNA test prep. Uh, it's It's been lots of challenges, but it's been well worth it, well received by the community. I started out in the state of Arizona last year in June and um, happy to report I am now in 20 states effective, I think last month and three uh, U.S. territories, Guam, uh, the Virgin Islands and Mariana Islands. So it's been a tremendous undertaking. The two test vendors that I'm with right now is, thank you, Christina, is uh, the main test vendors are Pearson View and Headmaster. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's get started. So I'm going to share my screen and my PowerPoint. I've also downloaded, uh, uh, not downloaded, but um, put the PowerPoint on uh, the handouts for you. So if you'd like to download that, you're welcome to, but I'm gonna share my screen so you can follow along with me. So here we go. Okay. All right. So, can everybody, uh, are we good with seeing my screen, Victoria? All right. Sounds good. All right. So, we completed the introductions. All right. So, Let's talk about, again, our topic is uh, resources for pass rate. So why is a pass rate important? Let's talk about that. Um, well, why it meets, we have to meet as CNA programs, we have to meet state mandated, state mandated minimal pass rates, both for the written and for the skills test, for both. It's mandatory. If we don't, our uh, programs go into deficiency and it has other consequences as well. A, a pass rate that is above the pass, the state mandated pass rate is a reflection of well-prepared students. It's also a reflection of, of excellent instruction. It's also uh, for students who are consumers, they get value for their efforts and for their money because for most students, their tuition is not free. So we want consumers to feel that they are getting value for their efforts. And that's not to say that we don't put our effort in, of course, and they have to put theirs in as well, but all consumers feel that they want to get value for their efforts. Uh, students give positive reviews, also positive review from faculty as well. We all want to work with a successful organization and have success both personally and professionally. It's a great marketing and promotion strategy. You want to have bragging rights. Hey, you know, we have a high pass rate. We're about, way above the, the state average. It's a great marketing and promotion strategy. Um, it's used very well by organizations that have pa high pass rate. A competitive advantage, absolutely. And then, of course, it increases the pool of CNAs out in the workforce. Very, very important. So um, th those are some of the important aspects of um, of a high pass rate. Can you think of any others? Put it in the chat. Yeah, I think you hit them really well. Um, another one is, and I'm sure you'll probably talk about that, is um, also what's important from the student's um, pocket standpoint, right? From a financial standpoint, because students already are having a hard time even paying for the test, let alone, um, you know, back and forth trying to take it over. So, um, and we'll talk about that as well too, but. Yes, and, and some states have minimum attempts at the state exams, the certification exam. So if students do not pass, uh, typically it's after three attempts, then the students have to retake the entire course all over again, which is uh, painful. I mean, just imagine it, going through nursing school, 
paying some of the nursing schools are what eighty five ninety thousand dollars for a BSM program and not passing the NCLEX after certain attempts all that money is is it, it just no value for that money just extremely painful yeah Kiyoko says uh price point you can you can leverage your price point for your services with a very uh higher pass rate too very good point Kiyoko. oh yeah that is a, that's a great great point absolutely okay so let's talk about strategies to achieve a high pass rate first of all having a strong curriculum very, very important. Um, the strong curriculum, how do we get there? It has to be state compliant. Every state has a prescribed uh, it, curriculum. And you want to, minimum is, is fine, but you want to exceed that, of course, absolutely. And then, of course, your curriculum needs to align with the state requirements, absolutely. So you need to know where those resources are for your uh, for your state where you can download that and make sure that your curriculum is compliant with the state requirements okay and then that you're testing according to, to that as well and what I mean by that is that if in your curriculum you have if in the state requirements you have content and you are not bringing that forward in your curriculum and not testing the students on on that content there's a miss there Okay, the other important part also of, a, of achieving a high pass rate is instructor orientation, development, and mentorship. This is so important. We cannot, as instructors, teach what we do not know. We just can't do it. If we, and it's, there's a huge, there's, um, and CNA is a specialized field. Uh, it's not it's not likely to have success as an instructor when they come from bedside, even if they're in a high, highly uh, competent field like an ICU nurse. Go from ICU nurse to CNA instruction and expect them to be successful and have those those uh, t those um, th those areas transfer over. I mean, there is a lot of um, skills that will transfer over, but there's a big difference between bedside care and teaching in a formal environment. So when instructors come over or when nurses come over to teach, they really do need to be oriented properly. They have to have the development, they have to have the mentorship, and they need to have the resources so that they can be successful as instructors. Very important. And I see a lot of myths with that because of the shortage of instructors. Go ahead, Victoria. Now, another point I would like to add to that definitely is um, Vicky and I have definitely noticed in looking at the candidate handbooks for each one of these different test um, organ testing organizations is that how you place a patient on a bedpan is different in one state versus how it is in another state. Although you as a nurse may know how to put a patient on the bedpan, teaching a CNA how to do it for passing the actual exam and what steps in that specific order that they have to do is a, is a skill in itself. So um, not to say that you may not even know that skill, you may know it, you just may not know how to teach it so that a person can pass it based upon how it's supposed to be presented in the checkoff environment when they, when they get ready to test. Exactly, exactly, absolutely. The next one is compare your school's pass rate with the state requirement and with other schools. So why that is important is because you wanna know, oh wow, I'm 78%, um, but you know uh, what everyone you know the majority of the schools are functioning at 89 percent oh wow i've got some work to do so they're the majority of the of the programs are doing a lot of things right and i'm lagging behind very important to keep that in mind the uh, test vendors will generally provide uh the schools the training programs with their pass rate and sometimes they also provided the pass rates for all, all the training programs in the entire state. So you want to benchmark that. Where am I at compared to what the state requirements are and where is my program at compared to other pr training programs in my state as well? So very important to kind of know where, where am I at? So just, uh, and keep track of that information. You want to know sometimes they're offered, this information is offered by test vendors or your state on a quarterly basis, sometimes on a monthly basis, but typically it's on a yearly basis. Mm -hmm. I think it should be offered um, on a quarterly basis, just like they do for the NCLEX, but um, that there's some work in progress there, so. Um. <laughs> but yeah, you should have a plan in place to review that not only with the instruct not only with the program coordinator but also the instructors there should be a plan in place to review that exactly exactly and with that i just want to interject it's important to be having 
uh, periodic meetings with your faculty and your uh, leadership um, to go over this information. Hey, we're doing really great that you bought extra resources for me or um, we got this in place, we got extra mannequins and it's showing on our pass rate. I think it was a good decision. Or you know what, we have some work to do here. This is not, this. we had a decline, something's going on. We've hired too many new instructors and it's showing in our pass rate. So again, it's, you wanna, you wanna have a comparison because you don't know where you're at until you look at where the, the field is as well. Okay, other strategies to achieve a high pass rate is understanding the testing process. Uh, one of the ways to do that is attend a train the trainer course for some state that is mandatory it is not a complete guide to everything you need to know it's only a step there's much much more in, involved in that but that's at least a step and it gives some basics there also attend your test vendor workshops if your test vendor does workshops i would highly highly recommend that you attend them or your faculty attend them. Generally, they're free and they usually have them on a periodic basis. And it's not enough to just attend one time. Oh, I attended it for eight months ago. I don't need to attend again. The more you attend, the better it is for you because we know that the more that we hear information, the more it sticks. And then we each time we take something away, each time I probably have attended I don't know, dozens and dozens, maybe even a hundred workshops from my test vendor, but of course I was a facilitator for them. But at the same time, each time that a, a workshop was available, I tried every, I made every effort to attend. So lots to take away there. And then take those resources back to, to your training program and share it with the rest of your faculty and uh, the, um, the, uh, the school personnel, important. Um, read and know your state's nurse aide candidate handbook. Again, we cannot teach what we do not know. It's amazing how many times um, students ask uh, instructors specifics about the testing process and instructors are not able to answer. Those CNA, those nurse aide candidate handbooks, we should know them by heart. We should know that information without fail. I mean, there should be almost no question that is asked of us from those nurse aide candidate handbooks that we cannot answer. That That is very, very valuable that we, we know uh, what is in there and how to help students overcome testing in so many areas, anxiety, the correction process, what steps and all of that. So I'm going to get into that a little bit more. And also, as far as the nurse aide candidate handbook, if you're if your state allows it, that should be like the number one resource that they should get. They should get that resource on day one. Highly, highly recommend it and spend time going over that candidate handbook. It is not enough just to hand it out to the students and say, we're gonna go over this eventually. And like, no, you have to make that candidate handbook a priority if your state allows it. Victoria, I know in Georgia that you cannot reference the candidate handbook, correct? Okay, okay, again, it's state specific. There's 50 states and three territories, so it, they're all different, all different. So make sure that you abide by your state requirements. And then if permissible in your program, in your state, become an RN test evaluator. I, after about a year and a half of becoming a, an instructor, I became an RN test evaluator because I wanted to know the testing process and I wanted to be able to take that information back to my class and become and, and better prepare my students and become a resource for my training program. And so I just ate, slept, and drank CNA at all times, the testing process and whatnot. So, and eventually I became a facilitator for the, te the test vendor that I used to work for here in Arizona. So I stayed with him for 10 years. So it's an invaluable amount of process to be able to um, be a RN test evaluator or for headmaster, they call them RN test observers. So I'd like to ask the audience, how many of you are, uh, are, are permitted to be instructors and also RN test evaluators in your state? And, or if you, do you know somebody? Because <laughs> having someone that you know on your team that can give you that information is also very valuable.
So no test evaluators in any of the states that we're, we're, we are um, from our audience. And there's always a shortage. You do get paid to be an RN test evaluator. I mean, of course, you're not going to get rich or anything like that, but it's the knowledge that you're seeking. Of course, our time is valuable, but it's the knowledge that you're seeking that is so, so valuable. Okay, so let's keep going here. So another way to achieve a high pass rate, and I really wanted to uh, spend some time on this one, is instruction, uh, instructional continuity. It's so important for every instructor to be teaching this curriculum the same with very little deviations. And that's so important. If you have a day class and an evening class and a weekend class, all your instructors should be teaching the material exactly the same with very, very little outliers or deviation. I mean, you can add some resources here and there that are a little bit, uh, that are a little bit instructor specific, but for the most part, the, the content should be taught consistently across the board. And that's where I see quite a bit of disconnect because students complain that uh, when Mrs. Smith teaches something, it's different than what how Mr. Jones teaches it and the students get very confused. Remember, these are novice learners. They do not know yet what is the correct way or the incorrect way. So any um, any anything that is off balance or that is different will throw them off and confuse them. And that's a, a really a, a huge takeaway from that. So how, uh, how can we ins provide instructional con continuity? Well, one of the things for the classroom is I have, uh, for me, what I did is I created a PowerPoint for the entire curriculum and I had it on the desktop of my computer at school. And every instructor used that same PowerPoint file on the school laptop to teach the same content. So there was none of this. Mrs. Jones brought in uh, her jump drive and put it in the computer and taught off of that. Mr. Smith brought in his jump drive and taught off of that. That is just too, too confusing and it, it just creates um, too much of a disconnect. So I would not recommend that. So in the classroom, uh, again, teach off of the same content in, in the same way for each instructor. Um, the other thing also as far as resources, agree on what resources are you going to use a, um, a YouTube video that everybody is gonna be consistently watching? How about uh, videos from the, from the publisher? Agree on which ones you're gonna use and which ones you're not going to use. That's very important as well, that uh, for pretty much no deviation from, from the curriculum. Any thoughts on that, Victoria? You know, I mean, of course, there may be a little bit of differentiation in terms of the implementation. Like, um, you know, so if you're going to go into, okay, yeah, we're going to do, a, I would like for you guys to do a case study on this and, you know, or a class discussion on that. Um, I mean, of course, for an instructor as they're teaching, they may recognize as they're teaching that certain students aren't getting it. You know, you kind of know you can, you're teaching and you can see the looks on the faces. And so of course, allowing them the opportunity to use different learning um, techniques, but still as long as it's the content is um, similar, you know what I mean? So that yeah. would, would be your take on that, allowing them to, um, to use different types of learning methods. Yes. And if, and if, uh, you find a, a handout or a teaching strategy that is working really well with your class, share it with the other instructors because oftentimes I hear students say, I've heard students say, well, Mrs. Jones gives us this handout and other students say, wow, we never get that handout. That would really be great if we got that handout. That would help me out a lot. So once again, uh, disconnect and confusion with the students. So. Yeah, that's, that's important to stay um, consistent. Okay, so in the clinicals, again, a strategy, strategies to achieve a high pass rate for clinicals, ensure that the students practice skills that they will be tested on. So I know if there is a disconnect between theory in the, in the lab and then going out and practicing those skills in clinicals. I know that, I get that, because I've done hundreds of clinical hours, both as a nursing instructor, L LPN instructor, and as a CNA instructor. So I understand that. But nevertheless, that's why it's so important for us as instructors to be there at, at, with them in clinicals and actually helping and doing skills, being actually engaged with them. 
Also, have a core set of skills to check off students in clinicals, the ones that your program knows are especially challenging for the students. My experience has been that uh, taking a radio pulse and taking manual blood pressures and maybe positioning those skills are often in every, uh, testing and pretty much in every state. And those are the skills that I find that students struggle with, with testing. So again, these are, are very precise skills, locating the radio pulse, counting the radio pulse, whether it's 30 seconds, one minute, um, the manual blood pressure. I think the manual blood pressure is probably has the highest fail pass rate for skills in all the states. It's just a very challenging skill. And then about that real quick. Sure. I tell people if you have a program and um, you only provide the blood pressure cuff and the stethoscope in clinical for them, and that's it. I don't know about that. I highly recommend that you consider incorporating the a cost of that into your tuition, okay? And provide every student with a blood pressure cuff and a stethoscope because that skill you cannot gain overnight, okay? And that's usually one of the skills that are taught later in the curriculum. It's not taught up front um, because it's not part of that first 16 hours mandate. So. I, I highly recommend you incorporating that into your tuition so that the students can have that and then they can practice at home outside of the lab because that you're right, Vicki, that's a skill that is very hard for people. And, pe and a lot of schools don't want to take up the cost for that uh, or they don't want to pass that cost down. But now on the back end, what's going to happen to your pass rate potentially? Exactly, exactly. I absolutely agree with that. And generally speaking, regardless of which program I'm teaching and uh, the length of the program, I usually teach manual blood pressure on day two, maybe day three, but I general, it's generally on day two. And on manual blood pressure, I usually spend just on manual blood pressure, three hours teaching manual blood pressure. I have it like is so structured that I know where I'm supposed to teach exactly in what order, what resources, what what um, what they need to have. I uh, when I hand out the stethoscopes, when I hand out the blood pressure cuffs, um, how they practice. I teach them how to use the valve, the gauge, how to read. Um, everything. It's very, very structured. Like I said, about three hours. So the students have to be checked off in the lab on manual blood pressure. Then they have to be checked off in clinical on manual blood pressure. And then as part of their skills final exam, they're checked off on manual blood pressure again. So they have to meet each one of those hurdles in order to pass the course. So manual blood pressure for my programs, was not an issue for my pass rate, not at all. So again, um, all my student, all the instructors were required to check off each student on vital signs in the clinical setting because those were very precise skills, and I know that um, students struggle with them. So that's why it was essential. It was required for students to be passed off on on these uh, the vital signs in the clinical setting, and then as part of their final exam as well. So uh, Nicole says that in her state of Washington, it looks like blood pressure, radial pulse, and the knee highs are often failed, she said. And then um, and then Mrs. Randall said uh, peri care. Yes, peri care is a multi-step. Um, and usually because of all those multiple steps, usually uh, that is a highly failed one as well. You're right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there is a difference between testing for peri care and actually doing peri care in the clinical setting and the way they see the CNAs do peri care in the clinical setting. Huge disconnect. But again, talking about that during post-conference is important. Being engaged with the students and actually helping them do peri care um, is, is very important. And then uh, instruct the other uh, area also for providing uh, clinical uh, a pass rate is instructors actively participate in clinicals. We talked about that. And then documentation, I know we all have documentation for clinicals, I've had, I've had plenty myself, but uh, documentation is second, safety and being at the bedside with the students is number one, that's the priority. And the, I generally find that I have plenty of time in the clinical setting to finish up my documentation so I don't have to do it when I get home. Some days are busier than others, but again, being engaged in clinicals at the bedside doing care with the students, is invaluable and they 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 um they so enjoy it. you wouldn't think that they would but they really really do 
Uh, Juanita says that she teaches blood pressure on the first day of class because she recognizes that it takes longer for them to learn. Yes, absolutely. Great job, Juanita. Absolutely outstanding. And also, I also have a, a, um, a vital sign skill sheet in which a vital sign uh, sheet where they have to do 30 vital signs before they can go to clinic. Uh, before they I can like go that. To Yes, so I have a vital sign sheet so that they do vital signs on each other and they do 30 of them and nobody moves on to clinicals until those 30 are done. So that's not a question. It's like you have to get it done. And they do, boy, they hustle with those vital signs while they're either waiting their turn to do their, their skill if I'm doing positioning or pericure, whatever. Uh, they're working on those vital signs or if they need to watch extra times during the skill that I'm doing, that's fine. But they're constantly uh, working on those vital signs and 30 is the minimum. They can do more, but 30 is the minimum. And again, uh, I every in, in, uh, student gets checked off on vital signs before going to clinicals in the lab. All right, so let's talk about the lab. And so in the lab, uh, know the skills in your state's nurse aid candidate handbook. So again, I talked about this, but you have to know, the instructors have to know that. We cannot teach what we don't know. And I know some instructors feel somewhat bashful about teaching skills and you know they, they're not sure about themselves. So one of the things is practice. Practice with a colleague. Um, practice uh, you know, on your own and you'll get better at it. And eventually that, that um, uncertainty will go away. The more you practice like anything else, that uncertainty does go away. But uh, very, very important to know those skills because the way you demonstrate them in the lab is the way the students are going to do them. And if we're not demonstrating them competently or uh, we're making a lot of corrections when we're demonstrating, they're not, they're not going to have a firm grasp. Okay. Mm -hmm. So skills of failure uh, in the state exam is, is, is higher than the written test typically. So for most states, students tend to fail the skills test more than the written test. Okay, so know the mandatory skills in your state. Every state has mandatory of the first skill. Know which ones those are and make sure you check off the students on those and then know how many skills the students are going to be tested on. Some states, it's there's tested on five skills. Some of them, they're only tested on four and some are only tested on three the computer only randomly selects three based on the difficulty factor of the skill again this is all information that you will get from the candidate handbook and going from to the test vendors workshops as well so know how many and when a student can make corrections that's important the student should know that as well almost every state allows students to make corrections during the state exam but you have to be able to tell them uh, tell the student when and um, at what point they can make corrections. Okay, the other thing also that leads to a high pass rate is continuity in demonstrating the skills. I think of that's probably the most important part of, of the lab is continuity in demonstrating skills. Uh, I, I was in a program as the coordinator and director of nursing and I had 22 instructors, huge program, uh, over 700 students per year. And I had two, 22 instructors that were uh, reporting to me. Imagine the disconnect if every instructor did skills their own way. Just mm -hmm. absolute chaos, absolutely chaos. Uh, I was, I'm very happy to let you know that our pass rate was in the high 90s consistently year after year for that level of students. So we were doing something right. Um, but that's, that's key is continuity and skills demonstration. Uh, so leadership or as a group agree on how to demonstrate those skills. You, ha you have to come together and say, how are we going to teach those skills? It's, it takes, it's, it's time consuming and sometimes they can be very contentious meetings, but come together as a group. It's for the sake of your program, your job, the student's pass rate, um, many things. So, so much is at stake. Okay. You, when demonstrating the skills, decide on how the actor is going to be set up or the client, some states call it the client, how the client's going to be set up. Oftentimes that's key because sometimes it's a bolded step to put the actor or the client in supine position. So you should be starting out this, this, the client or the actor in a Fowler's position 
that's important because if it's a key or bolded item to put the client in a supine position, then you should set it up accordingly as well. Decide on the supplies used. You would not think that getting an extra washcloth, Mrs. Jones uses three washcloths, Mr. Smith uses two washcloths, that extra washcloth makes a big difference for the students, but it does. It really, truly does. So agree on what supplies to be used. Very, very important. Continuity again and less confusion. And then steps, each instructor should be a mirror image of one another. And it really does make a difference. And remember that sometimes students are going to be making up time in one class or another class. And so when they see that there's difference in teaching and teaching techniques, it really does throw off the students and they talk to each other. That's not the way how I learn it. Now I'm confused because she does it this way. Now you do it that way. So they get confused. So try to agree um, on, on all these, these aspects here on all these points. Very, very important. Come together on that. Okay, so let's talk about that. So what are the consequences of not having lab continuity? So share that with me. What do you think? What, why didn't I cover or can you expand about what, what I have already covered? I can definitely say, Vicki, that some of the things you've already mentioned in terms of there being multiple instructors and each instructor doing something different, and you are so right. I mean, it could be now I'm so confused because you're telling me to get four washcloths and, and before I've always were getting only two. So now, you know, or, you know, maybe no one's really told the student how many washcloths they should really be getting. So now they're in the middle of period care and they're short two washcloths and they're freaking out. Um, right, right. So that is, that's a very, very good point. The other thing also, Victoria, and it just prompted my, my thought for me, is have enough supplies You'd be surprised how many times I go into training programs and they have 10 washcloths and they have 10 students. And I'm thinking yes. students cannot learn if we don't have sufficient resources, if there's not enough washcloths, if, you know, the mannequin is all beat up and the peri part is just all mangled up and there's just no way to properly clean. I mean, we have to have sufficient and adequate and workable supplies. Um, the, uh, the other thing also is um, uh, actually doing the skills. I, I, as a tester, I was often asked from students, do I really need to use water for the bath? And right. I'm thinking, oh, no. What, what? Um, I, it scared me because I thought it, it scared me for the student because they were not likely going to pass because the training did not prepare them for the testing process. So no, we never used water because we didn't, we, we didn't have enough washcloths or we never had enough towels or we weren't taught. We were just taught to pretend in testing. There will be no pretending. They will actually, if there's a bed bath skill, they will actually have to wash the, act, the actor or the client's face, their eyes, mm -hmm. their under armpit. So the way you teach it in lab is the way that students are going to take it into testing. So um, it's very, very important to, to make sure that you're using water, demonstrating the skills the way they are going to do it in the testing process. Yeah, okay. I, ha and then I have the other students who are, who are doing bad on a skill and because they have to constantly do it over, they just want to emulate rather than actually doing it. Um, in, in a way to just hurry up and get past and get through because they, they think in their mind, well, I know it. I just keep messing on, on up on those two steps. I don't need to do all that. You know, yeah, it's you every time. Yes, and that's where we have to hold the line and say, uh, no, you, you need to do them the way I taught you to do them and the way you, you are going to be required to do it in testing because you need to pass. So we're going to do it the right way or you're not going to get a pass. I'm not going to pass you off on this competency. So hold the line. And then the other thing I wanted to spend a little time talking about is avoid what I call nurse rigidity. And what I mean by that is saying, I'm a nurse, I've been a nurse for a long time and I know best. So it's not really necessary for me to put the uh, put the client or actor on the bedpan this way, even though the, the testing process requires it, I know it my way and this is the best way to do it. And what I say to that is at whose expense? Always at whose expense? And it's always going to be at the student's expense. It just is because we need to help the students teach them to pass this test. Now, 
is should we only teach the test? Absolutely not. That is not ethical. That is not, I don't want to say legal, but it's not ethical. And we need to teach them total care. But at the same time, once we get down to the testing process, we need to teach them so that they can pass that test. Because if they can't, all the efforts we put them through have been for nothing if we can't get them past that test. So avoid that nurse rigidity. I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 30 years. I know exactly how to put a patient on the bedpan, and this is the best way to do it. No. What do the steps in the nurse aid candidate handbook say? That's what's key. So let, your, let our pride go as a nurse and work together as a team. What is best for the students? What's best for the school? What's best for our program? So think of it that way. Okay. And then lastly is final exam. You should all be giving your students a written final exam. If we're not, then it's, a, it's, it's your, it's your, you are um, losing the last opportunity to hold back or check that students to see if they're ready for their state exam. So the, on the written exam, I usually do 100 questions. I, uh, I've never done less than 100 questions. It's always cumulative for the whole course. And then my uh, pass rate for that final exam is generally five percentage points above what the state requires. So if the pass rate is in your state 75%, my pass rate for the final written exam is 80%. I have a 5% margin gap to work with there. So if I know a student's getting above the 80%, they're very likely to pass the certification test if the, if the pass rate is 75. So um, I can expand upon that a little bit more if, if I didn't make that clear. Does that make sense no, that makes to everybody? Sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So make sure that your pass rate for your, that you set your pass score for your written exam above your state requirement. I generally do five percentage points above. Okay. On the next is also you should be giving your students a skills final exam as one as well. Administer the exam as close to the certification exam as possible. You should be mimicking the certification test. So if your certification test requires hand washing to be the first skill and then four other randomly selected skills, do it that exact, exact way. Time them. Um, put, put your game face on. Don't put your I, I, I coddle you, I love you instructor face. Now is the time to give them a, a, a taste of what the stress that they're going to feel during testing. So very important to administer that skills final exam. And then again, mimic the same grading system as the, your, your state requires and, and specifically the bold steps. So I just want to go over a little bit of numeric for you. So I generally do the steps in 100 points. And my pass rate is 80%. So for one skill, if I have 10 steps, they have each one of those steps are, are 10 per, are 10, uh, 10 points. However, if there's a bolded step, I make that bolded step 20 points or 21 points if they miss it so that they will not, they will fail if they don't hit that bolded step. So I hope that makes sense for everybody. So on the steps, when I'm doing my calculation for the grading system, I always make the bolded steps uh, higher so that if they fail, if they don't hit that bolded step, it fails them and then they don't they don't move on because it would be the same thing in the testing process and the certification test that if they do not hit those bolded steps that they will they will fail. So I want to get some thoughts on that. Um, I do have a question. I understand completely what you're saying, but I do have a question about that. So um, I know, like, for instance, here um, in the state of Georgia, um, if you miss a step, like you just said, especially a bold step, um, you automatically fail regardless. But it is up to the, the person. But they can correct themselves. Oh, well, yeah, of course. They can but definitely they can correct, correct themselves. But if they complete the entire test and then say, um, I'm done, and, and they missed a step, not only if it was a bold one, but let's say they intertwined or missed a few steps that were not bolded, that leaves subjectivity and they will still fail regardless. Um, so- Yes, um, because it's on the point system. 
Got you. Yeah, it's based on a point system. They I either have is, to. Uh, I think that it's ahead. fair. I think that it's fair for people to know that um, they can get all the way to the very end. And if, if they at the end and they realize, oh, my God, the second skill I did wrong, they can then still say, hey, I got five minutes left. Um, I recognize that I did skill number two wrong. I want to do it again. I think that's important. Right, right. And some know. states allow them. Contains yes, if they've, and it depends on the state. That's very state specific. And in, uh, in, for headmaster, the test vendor, they can be finished with all their skills and go back to correct any of the previous skills they completed before they say they're done. But uh, for Pearson View, I think they have to make a correction on that specific skill before they can move on to the next skill. If they've already moved on to the next skill and they want to make a correction on the previous skill, they cannot. So that's that's how the, the Pearson View book reads. But know your state vendor testing process for that. But anyways, uh, make sure, try to mimic your grading system for your skills final exam to, to, uh, to mimic the state exam as well in terms of the grading system. And then lastly, don't pass students who fail the course final exam or the course uh, yeah the course final exam and i bring that up is because it is so difficult to to not pass a student we want to do all kinds of point rearranging and we want to you know give them a third or fourth chance i want to i want to um really tr warn you against not doing that because first of all you have uh, the potential for getting yourself in trouble with your school because if you do it for student A, you're gonna have to do it for student B, C, D, E, and F, and all of them all across the way. So there's an, an issue there with making sure that you're treating all your students fairly and equitably. That's number one. Number two, if they pull, if your heartstrings are being pulled on because the student failed, then that student most likely is gonna fail the state certification exam as well. So there's a reason the student did not pass your, the final exam, whether that be the written or the skills or both. So I want to um, get some feedback from the audience is uh, on having had experience on uh, wanting to kind of reduce your, your, um, your, your uh, pass, pass scores there or reduce your, your barriers so that students can get past the course. Any thoughts on that? Of, uh, the answers, um, okay, sometimes students may hide language barriers. Yes. And hopefully those get addressed early in the course, not when it's at final exam. But if it is at final exam, remember, they'll take, they'll take that into certification testing as well. So maybe some, some remediation, additional resources, study time, study groups, you know, passing them because I, of language barriers. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that I learned very early on was that I really needed to have a, um, an assessment like a, um, an assessment before the student even comes into the program. Uh, when I first started my program, I said I was going to have one, but by the time I got to, to grand opening and you know things were moving so fast, that left my radar. And then I started admitting students that was not they were not taking an assessment exam, and as they were going through the program, to your point, I was finding language barriers or comprehension barriers, um, and they were very hard to work with, very hard to work with, and taking up a lot of time. And um, and then to your point, going off to take the exam and not passing. So uh, I I found out very early on you have to have some type of an assessment. Um, for students, a competency assessment when they come in before they are admitted to your program. If you guys are not doing that already, I highly recommend it. If you do not have a school yet, it's something you really need to think about because those, uh, yeah, because those people are you're wasting their money, their time, and they're going to ruin your pass rates. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing also is in uh, several years ago, Arizona did not have a, a pre-assessment for students, and then we found that to be the case. 
And so uh, Arizona implemented a requirement that uh, all training programs have to do a pre-assessment on reading uh, and then math and something else. I don't remember what it all is, but they're, now they don't specify a pass for that or anything like that, but they do require a pre-assessment uh, of a student. So that has helped some, but uh, there's still ways to get around that from a student's point of view in terms of if it's done online or uh, other issues. So yes, pre-assessment is very, it, it's, it's, I would highly recommend implementing a pre-assessment. The community colleges and the, um, the high schools, I believe do have that already in place. It's generally mandatory, but it's the, private training programs that um, don't, don't necessarily always have them. And there is a revenue issue with that as well. I know that, you know, you're, the, uh, the training programs want the revenue, want the enrollment, but of course, if you're, you're taking on students that are not prepared to pass the course for whatever reason, it's gonna take a lot of time and gonna spend a lot of money and a lot of labor hours trying to help that student along. And sometimes it's possible to do it. And sometimes it's just not, they were not meant to be there from the very beginning. So. Yeah, and to, and to your point, what you just said, I see Lisa wrote here. Um, I really have to think on that one. Um, that is one of my biggest concerns because I wanna make sure that my students pass. I'm even thinking about offering free review, especially for those that may be nervous test takers. Ooh, I mean, Lisa, I know what you're saying there and I know where your heart is, but I don't know about that one. They're going for free review. It's, you just want to catch them early on. Mm -hmm. Well, also in my, in my, uh, my syllabus, I embed mandatory reviews. Well, not mandatory, optional reviews. They are optional. When I say reviews, I mean practice sessions where they come into the class, into the lab to practice. So they're optional, but I already put them in the syllabus so that the students from the very beginning know that uh, this time is set up, the lab will be available for you, and this time is set aside for you to come into the class, into the lab, and practice. So yes, it is optional, but it's not optional. It is optional because it says here it's optional, but I'm asking you to please come in and, and set your time aside knowing from the get-go you're expected to be here. So you're going to be here with your classmates and you, I want you all to pass together. So if you put it that way or the way I put it, I, I have generally done well and the students don't generally uh, complain about it. It is on the syllabus saying it's optional, but I said I'm going to be here. I'm going to be waiting for you. I'm going to help you out and I want to make sure that you pass this test. So, all right. Okay, so go ahead. Okay, so um, so we talked about um, the importance of a pass rate, of a high pass rate. So now I want to talk a little bit more about what happens when there is a low pass rate. So one of the things I really want to focus on is um, this, what I call the cost of failure. And I just have two examples here. So I did an analysis and of in 2018, the pass rate for Arizona and Nevada. So the number of candidates that failed the written test and the number of candidates that failed the skills test, and then the amount of money that the students paid for a failed certification test. So let's look at Arizona. So in Arizona, 512 students failed the written exam and 767 failed the skills exam. Again, the skills exam has failed more often than the written exam. The total cost of their, of their failed exam, the testing fees was $82,856. That is a lot of money, a lot of money for these students to have gotten not where they wanted to be in return. So in other words, not, no value for their money. So they spent the money to take a test and they didn't pass it. That's a huge, that's a huge cost. So I have Nevada. In Nevada, uh, the number of failed candidates taking the written exam was 387. The number of candidates that failed the skills test was 393. Again, the skills test is failed more, more often than the written exam. And the cost to, uh, to those students was 58,635. And this is the first attempt. Okay, this is the first attempt. So the table does not include non-monetary costs. 
So what would you say would be some non-monetary costs that the students uh, would have to incur um, that is a, a, above and beyond that 82,000 and 58,000? Oh man. Put it in the chat for us, please. Yes, I'm not even gonna say anything yet. I'm gonna let them type that in because I wanna see your thoughts. Um, while you guys are typing that, um, Vicki Sade asked, um, what should a pre-assessment look like? Um, you know, I, I know what a pre-assessment should look like, but what type of, um, can you explain to her what that would look like and what type of resources you would use for pre-assessment? For me, it's a written exam and my pre-assessment, it consisted of reading comprehension, both uh, select all that apply, fill in the blank, and then giving a, a, a and I think it was essay as well, a, a short essay, a brief essay. And then also math as well. And I'm not talking about calculus, but I'm talking about some basic math skills because I have seen some students that struggle with the most basic arithmetic, most basic arithmetic. I mean, to the point where it is, um, in Arizona, they allow you, the students to take the pulse for 30 seconds and multiply by two, struggling, struggling to add 45 plus 45 or 45 times two. I, I, just, I, I just thought, how did you get past my test? But I know how they got past the test. We offered it online and somebody else took, the, took it for them because they told me so. So that's another story altogether. So it would consist of reading, um, comprehension, fill in the blank, a brief, essay maybe or a brief um, summary uh, essay and then of course math and it could be uh, just arithmetic or um, math a story a math story there are some pre-assessment resources out there to mm -hmm. um, different tests and things like that that you could google to find yes um, some are free some are costs you know but and and mine was uh 45 questions 45 questions and i think about uh, 30 of those were uh, reading comprehension and the other were math related. Okay, Connie says, are they allowed to test with the state if they didn't pass the class? The answer to that is no. Mm -hmm. No, they have to have the certificate of completion. They have to have passed your course in order to go take the state exam. And that's in every state and the three mm -hmm. territories. And that's in the federal regulations for CNA. Yes. All right. So look, they, we've got some good answers here, Vicki. Okay. Um, the money they could have made working instead of going to school would factor into the cost of failure. Yes. Fantastic. That's a great one. Mm -hmm. um, my personal one is maybe daycare. Maybe now I have to pay for a babysitter or daycare again just mm -hmm. to come take this test again. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Daycare, the cost of gasoline, maybe having to get an Uber or a Lyft or, you know, whatever the case is, transportation costs to the to test again. The cost of taking the test again. Uh, generally speaking, for the for the written test, it's about thirty to forty dollars to retake the written test. For the skills test, on average, it's about uh, eighty to ninety five dollars to retake the, the skills test. And of course you add those two up if they, if they have to take both. So about $120 if they have to take both. What other ones? What, those are great examples. What other ones? What, other? Yeah, what are some other um, things you guys can think about? Rita says, is the pre-assessment required to be accepted into, the pro into your program? Um, so, that is a, a state requirement. Some states require that you have to do a pre-assessment. Some states do not require it. But even in the states that don't require it, it's then up to you whether or not that's a requirement that you want to have for your school. So just know that whatever the state's requirements are, you can always go above and beyond them if you choose to. You have that right. But um, it, that's a state specific. I would highly recommend that, uh, strongly recommend giving that a lot of thought and, and putting a pre-assessment in place. Highly recommend. It's going to save you heartache, headache, and money. <laughs> All of it. All of it. Because if it, once you have that student and that student is not performing, 
imagine the time and energy that's going to require for you to get the th student through the program again, tutoring them, finding them resources. And sometimes students are not happy. They're not happy, and then you might be dealing with a legal issue. Well, you know, you, you knew this, and maybe oh, it just goes on and on and on. Make sure you write that in your policies and procedures as well about what the, if you implement a, uh, a pre-assessment that it is required and what is the pass rate for that. Okay, mm -hmm. any other comments about the non-monetary costs? How about the emotional impact of failing the test? We can't even put a price on that, huh? Now, and how people will just give up and won't even come back and try again. Exactly, exactly. And remember, we're not talking about bachelor's or master's prepared individuals. These are individuals that are oftentimes uh, fragile from life events. And this is maybe their first time at attempting independence from all kinds of relationships or from their age group or life circumstances. These these are fragile individuals. They may not come back. Absolutely. Okay. All right. All right. So overall, with having a high pass rate, our goal is to increase the pool of CNAs. And we the sort of not passing the certification test should not be should not be an obstacle. So we want to remove that obstacle. That's been my goal with with what I'm doing is my mission is to remove the obstacles of not passing the certification test. Also, uh, the goal is to increase the critical shortage of CNAs. Uh, I was speaking with a, a stakeholder in California just a couple of days ago, and she informed me that the shortfall of CNAs in California alone is 30,000, 30,000, and I know California is a big state, but imagine that. What is the trickle-down effect of that? So let's talk about that. What is the trickle-down effect of that massive shortage of CNAs um, in just one state? Put in your comments in the, in the chat for me. And I can't tell you how many people reach out to me, Vicki, and say, oh, I'm fearful that the market is saturated for starting a CNA school. Or, oh, you know, I'm fearful that there's just already too many and, you know, are, are they are CNAs even really needed? Yes, like, I can't even explain how much of a shortage there is everywhere. There is. And yeah. um, even though California is a large state, I went to that, that CNA conference, the CNA Fest. Um, there was a young lady there that was representing California. And I think there's like almost 130,000 CNAs there. And that's still not enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we don't predict the, the shortage to be met anytime in the near future. I mean, all you have to go is go to long-term care, uh, long-term care, hire websites. And you can just see the, the amount of CNAs that they need. Go to the hospital websites and see the amount of CNA open positions that are there. Uh, hospices. Uh, I, 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 I also work at a hospice and we just, we can't hire CNAs. We just can't find them. And it just goes on and on and on. So there's lots of opportunity there, but you, but starting a CNA school, you have to start it out smart from the very beginning. And that's what's so powerful about what Victoria does. She puts, she puts success in place from the very beginning. Yeah. Um, so we're waiting on those answers. Okay. Let's hear it. Pose the question again, Vicki, because oh. I think they may have forgotten. What is the consequence of such critical shortfalls of CNAs? What is the what are the care consequences? Poor care. Yes. yes. Bed sores for sure. For sure. Greater fall occurrences. Mm -hmm. What about burnt out staff? Yes. And then guess what? Those staff members are going to leave the mm -hmm. field. The CNAs are going to leave the field and go to somewhere else. And now the shortage is going to be even worse. Exactly. Exactly. It, it's, it's just not humanly possible for one CNA to take care of 15 patients. And I see it over and over again. Oh, it's just not doable. It's not doable. And why are they doing that? Because 
they, there's just not enough of them. Uh, so it, it, it burnout, of course, is burnout. Nobody can m maintain that. It's not fun to go to work. It's not. It's not pleasant to go to work. You, you just know that it's just going to be a brutal shift. Who wants that? Mm -hmm. So absolutely, poor poor quality of care. Absolutely, they, patients don't get uh, don't have the time to, to be fed. You know, in a um, patiently. You know, they rush. I see them. They rush to feed the patients or dehydration. There's so many consequences to that. Okay. And then also uh, the goal is to achieve career and academic goals when the students pass their certification test, like get a job as a CNA. And some students, that's that's their that's their goal. I, I don't want to go beyond this. I just, I want to be a CNA. And I said, good for you. We, we need people that are career CNAs, and so that's wonderful. Whatever your, your, your goal is, we want to help you achieve that. Also, help students move on to a nursing school. We know that CNA is often a prerequis prerequisite for nursing school. I would say that about anywhere from 70 to 60, you know, 70 to 50 percent of my students were pre-nursing uh, pre students. Uh, for sure, pre-nursing students. So again, we want to help them move on with their career goals, especially if CNA is a prerequisite for nursing school. If they cannot pass that certification test, they can't get into nursing school. What? How sad is that? I mean, I, I, again, it just hurts to just think about that, that the students cannot move on. Okay, and then some uh, individuals also uh, for CNA that take the CNA course, they obtain service hours for certain healthcare programs. And I see uh, CNA students that are uh, in PA programs. I see them that are um, uh, medical students that need uh, hours, healthcare hours. So again, it, it, it helps them out as well. So um, any other healthcare fields that you see coming in for taking the CNA? course um i have seen individuals who are um emts mm -hmm. um and they're, they're very upset about it but as you stated some of the nurse aid training programs are um requiring i'm sorry the nursing programs are requiring you have to have cna certification before coming in so i've had lots of emts uh, paramedics and things of that nature contacting uh, our cna program because they have to get the CNA in order to go to nursing school. They're yeah. not happy about that either. <laughs> but, but, you know, I get why they're not happy about that. But then, again, they are not taking care of people in nursing homes and in hospitals, right? They're doing emergency care. And so it is a little different. Mm -hmm. So I can kind of, I see both sides. But they learn. In the end, they learn something. Mm -hmm. I, I have found that it, they're, they do have a change of heart and they do learn quite a bit more than they thought. So, and mm -hmm. then we talked, number four, we talked about improving the quality of care at the bedside, especially. So we talked about that. All right. So just a little bit about um, fastest healthcare training. I, again, I'm a CNA test prep. So I want to help in this mission to, to promote CNAs, to help CNAs, to help instructors provide resources. And FACETS, our mission is to provide NA students and instructors with state-specific resources to pass a certification test the first time, the first time. So I am now in 20 states plus three U.S. territories. They are listed there. I hope your state is on there. And I'm going to take you a little bit to my website and show you what, what all is included in my CNA test prep. So... Again, um, we went over the areas here of where we're at in terms of the territories. Um, I'm going to go through the navigation, uh, navigating the website, registering. Oh, we're going to go over pricing. I also wanted to let you know that my uh, CNA test prep can be uh, accessed through a PC, tablet, and mobile. That's very, very important. I wanted to make sure that it was mobile usable because we live on our mobile phones. It's not just a phone anymore. It is a learning tool. It's communication. It is a dictionary. It's everything for us now. Okay. And then uh, today we are offering our 10% discount on the one year subscription with the discount code for being on this webinar. And it's regular at $349.99 and 10% discount. It's discounted to $314.99. I'll take you through the website here in just a minute. Again, easy to sign up and easy to pay. And then we also do curriculum integration with schools. So let me take you here to the website. 
Um, again, this information that's on the screen is on the PowerPoint that I uploaded, so you're welcome to print that out. All right, can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so here's my website, okay, uh, to register, name, uh, email address, password, set up, confirm your password, select the state. It usually pops up automatically, but just confirm it. If you have a discount code for today specifically, the discount code is secret cocktail. And then it'll automatically give the 10% discount on the one year subscription. Okay. And then you just press purchase there and it'll take you to the dashboard and pay and um, then it'll take you to the website. So let me show you some features here. Log in. And I'd like to add that um, her test prep is great, not only for students, but also for instructor in development as well. So yes. not really understanding how, what's going to do the steps, skills, you can utilize this for development for them. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so I, Pretending like I've registered and and I'm in and this is my site. So you will see this here. Okay, your name, you'll see your name there. And you'll have a dashboard button. And it takes you to, let's talk about tests. It consists of a test bank. And the test bank is knowledge test bank based on the different categories that are required by OBRA. So I have a version one and a version two of the test bank. And the test bank is uh, this is basic nursing skills so you can do the test and what's unique about my tests as well is they're not just multiple choice they're fill in the blank select all that apply and those select all the applies i created this test bank and i made them challenging because i wanted to be sure that the students were prepared so i know that in testing they're only going to get multiple choice questions but for me, I put in select all that apply and they're always more challenging because I wanted the student to think at a higher level doing these questions. So just click and that's pretty much it and move on to the next question. So that's how the test bank works, okay? And that's the knowledge test bank. Then I have, there's three tabs of knowledge test bank. Then I have a math test bank because I wanted the students to be prepared for the math test questions as well for the certification test, okay? Choose a mathematical equivalence, select all that apply, 75%, 0.75 and three quarters. Okay, that should, my internet's a little slow. So it's the right answer, it's just my internet is slow. Okay, all right. So let me take you back to the dashboard. So that is the test. And also, um, on some states, all of, all of Pearson View and all of uh, in Arizona only, they I have also a um, skills test. So let me take you to that as well. So here are the videos, highly sought after. That's actually very popular. The most popular thing that people come out come uh, talk to me about is the skills videos. So again, this is Arizona, so it may not apply to your state, but in Arizona, I have the skills here, okay, and they can maximize the page as well. Again, all mobile friendly. On the skill, it's listed what the skill is, what the supplies are, so you can use this for, for training purposes. You can say, you know what, if they're going to watch these videos, I might as well do the recommended supplies as well. Then I have notes, and the notes are actually tips after setup what to watch for, uh, what to be aware of, what is the test, test evaluator looking for. Then I have the steps from the candidate handbook and the bolded ones are bolded, if there are any. And then what I recently just uh, launched is a quiz for that skill. So I'm really excited about this because it, it, uh, has, it helps with learning and understanding the skill. So after they would watch the video, then they would go down here and do the, the test. So each skill has about uh, 10 to 13 questions to it, which really challenges uh, their knowledge of what they just watched on the video. And the videos are created specifically for that align with the candidate handbook for that state 
which is unique because uh, there's a lot of resources out there. Let me uh, let me uh, close this. That up. are generic. That are generic. The the videos from the um, the publisher are not state specific. The videos that they see on YouTube and any other resources that are out there, you don't know who who did them. They're whether they're credible resources, who's doing them, or whatnot. I um, edited all these videos. I'm featured in all these videos, and I do all these videos, and I sit with my video crew and um, make sure that these videos are what they need to pass the certification test. All right. So let me go back to us here and answer any questions you might have. Now, I have placed um, the website in the chat box. Okay, the website is in the chat box and I also place the code. Um, so if you are with us tonight and you decide that this is something you would like to sign up for, um, I did place the code that you get the discount. I did that I decided um, after I just left Virginia this past week that I will be gifting this to individuals who decide to do um, complete project management with me. So if you, because that's how much I, this that's how important i think this resource is so if you work with me and you decide that you want complete project management which means that i help you start your cna school i complete the paperwork for you um, i'm helping you understand what your policies and procedures um, should look like i'm helping you write your student handbook all of those things i'm taking on the entire project for you and collaborating with you to make sure that it aligns with your cho chosen business structure um, i i will be gifting this to you um, as a resource for you and your instructors to ensure that when you are open, your business is running most effectively and so that you can be successful um, in terms of instructor development. So I just wanted to put that out there. That's something I just decided to do uh, as a company this past weekend. And I didn't even tell you about that, Vicki, so. That's okay, no problem. I'm happy to support uh, you and the instructors and the students in any way that I can. Um, also, if there, if you get the one year option there, you can purchase for students at $45 per student. And uh, so we call that curriculum integration. And some training programs have opted to either raise their prices by $45 to make sure that they have this resource that prepares them for the certification test, or B, they have cut out some not as necessary resources in their training program so that they can embed it and have it available for the student. So um, I deal with schools that do various ways and I try to work with you on, um, let's see, strategies or uh, how, to, how to try to implement it and how to uh, utilize it in the classroom as well. So I'm happy to assist with that also. But it's my passion to help these students out, to help the training programs out, to help the instructors. And it's because it's just there just wasn't out there for them. And I thought it was such a disservice for for this for the students and for the instructors not to have what an RN would have, an LPN would have resources available to them at test prep. Any other questions for us? Yes, absolutely. And depending on the size of your training program, um, if you have a very large training program, I will do a site visit to help with instructor development, implementation, answer questions, because some training programs, especially the community colleges, have up to eight, eight uh, locations and it's a big undertaking to implement um, a new product. So I'm, I'm there to assist and travel there. Oh, the $45 purchase. Okay, so the $45 per student purchase is if a training program purchases the one year subscription and then they can purchase for their students at $45 per student and it's good for an entire year. So I know that some programs are not for an entire year, they're only for a couple of weeks, they're accelerated, maybe just a semester, but I couldn't have a time frame that's one month, you know, and then three months, so I just decided to extend it out for a whole year because some high schools are for a whole year. 
So it's $45 per student and they get access for an entire year if, um, if they do a curriculum integration. Okay, let's see here. Can can any can everybody hear Victoria? Sorry, I had my mute button on. Oh. <laughs> okay. um, what did everyone take away from this presentation? Name one thing that you found very uh, helpful, something that you didn't know, something that you will utilize in your practice moving forward. Um, can you guys share that with us so we so we know? And um, Sheila wants to know how long the how long is the discount code for, good for? Whenever she wants to use it, it's good for. Mm -hmm. Just so, um, just so, so they said she she learned about um, being consistent with teaching methods. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes. What else? What about you, other guys? I know one thing that, um, and it's so funny that I've, me and Vicki talk all the time, and, and to your point, Vicki, you learn something every time, and um, so one of the things that I would definitely say that I kind of took away from this, um, oh my gosh, now it left me, my brain is trying to, I'm trying to read the questions and answer at the same time. Yeah, me too, that's what throws me out. So, Lakeisha, absolutely, the nurse rigidity is like a plague, I absolutely <laughs> agree, and you know, the older we get, well, the more seasoned and experienced we get, let's put it that way, the more rigid we tend to be. And so as leaders, I hear that from leaders of CNA, uh, leaders pro program coordinators, that it's just hard to change the mindset of, of nurses that have been doing it their way over and over again. And I say to them, it is at whose expense? It's at the student's expense, always. It's going to be at the student's expense and the school's expense as well, because the instructor can leave, but the leaders and the owners of the schools are the ones that end up uh, with the consequences of a rigid instructor. So be, be flexible. Think about what is the greater good and who needs to um, who needs to benefit and and uh, the benefits of flexibility. So work together as a group. Believe me, when I had those 22 instructors that reported to me, it was rough sometimes. Um, oh, putting together a plan. That's what I was going to say. Um, making sure, you know, it's always a good reminder to make sure that you're putting together a plan and you're getting everyone on board and you're reassessing your, um, your skills pass rates. You know, some people take reassessment for granted. They say, oh, we, we came up with a plan and we're implementing it and we're going to implement it. But stopping to take a moment to do a pulse check, I know it's hard, but it should be mandatory. Thoughts on hiring instructors, Rita wants to know. There is such a shortage. And again, it has a trickle down effect, a shortage of a shortage of schools, a shortage of instructors, shortage of instructors. You can't, you can't accept any more students and if you can't accept more students, less pull of of uh, CNA candidates out there. So thoughts on hiring instructors is uh, vet them well, explain the, the expectations, make sure that you let them know that they're gonna go through a mentorship program as instructor development, give them the resources, and then give them a structured orientation and when they have to know what, um, when they're expected to know, read the candidate handbook, uh, what what part of the candidate handbook should they know about? When is the next workshop for your test vendor? Um, and we're just going to have to develop these instructors. And many of the instructors, um, and I don't think it's new to see. I don't think it's unique to CNA are retiring as well out of out of this. So out of out of a CNA in, um, education. So we're seeing those 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 uh, gaps in employment or those op that those employment gaps that just aren't getting filled okay having the vital signs completion in an, is uh, is an excellent tool to use yes absolutely absolutely 
I have a um, vital sign worksheet that I have created and they have to log those vital signs and they have to have 30 of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do like that as well. That is a good one. Yep, they have three chances before they pass that course to pass those vital signs in lab, in clinicals, and the final exam. I also found um, I's and O's to be um, a little hard for some students, but I think that goes back to understanding math. Yes, and that's why I put together that math practice worksheet, and you can use it in lab as well. Um, and you can use it in lab, so you can print them out from my website, and then when the students are either have uh, some quiet time or just a couple of minutes of free time, I tell them that they need to complete it, and they really enjoy doing them. I have calculators available in the in the lab and in the classroom, so they can work on those uh, during during times when they're waiting to do their skills as well. And I always tell them, you, I tell the students. There is no downtime in lab. I need to see you working towards uh, something all the time. If there's no reason you should be uh, not having something to do. There's always something to do in lab. Either there are vital signs or skills, but there's, there's always something to do. Yes, and you will see, especially if you're one instructor in a lab with 14 students, um, there's no way all the students can be doing the same thing at, at the same time. So you have to definitely find a way to ensure how that you are multitasking and giving different students different types of um, things to do while you're working with maybe someone that needs more one on one instruction at that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing I also wanted to share about the videos that I have found very useful as well is use them for remediation. When a student does not pass the checkoff for a skill, um, they just didn't do it well. I'm going to just choose Occupy Bed because it's such a long skill and they don't pass it. It's too time consuming for me to re-demonstrate it for one student again. Mm -hmm. So what I tell them is I tell them, go watch the Occupied Bed skill video, watch it. Maybe you need to watch it two times. Come back and maybe watch one more of your, of your um, classmates and then I think you'll be ready to get checked off again. So for me to go in there and do it all over again, it's just too time consuming. So I like it for remediation reasons as well. And it has worked very well. Yes, for sure. I mean, um, I even took it a step further and said, you need to do it multiple times yourself before you even come in and see me. And to be honest, I even told them they had three times to check off with me. You got three times to check off on each skill. And if you don't get it right by the third time, I, you're out of here because I can't spend uh, my entire lab checking you off on something because you're you're not taking it seriously. You keep playing mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that was just something that I chose to do. I I, I was more stringent. So it's up to you, but that's just something to consider because students will go back and do it one time and then say, okay, okay, I'm ready, I'm ready, and waste your time. You don't have that kind of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the other thing that I and Victoria, I can't see you again. So um, the other thing, oh, let's see here. The other thing also is that um, the videos are also great for preparation for lab. So I, on my syllabus, the students know every day what skills they're gonna be doing in the lab. They know, they know. So I tell them, now watch the videos prior to because I'm gonna demonstrate them just like that and I want you to be prepared. They're, if you watch the videos, you will be better prepared and that way you get checked off on the first attempt. So I tell them, you um, and if you don't have time to watch them, I said, at least put it on your cell phone while you're driving to school. Please don't watch the videos while you're driving. I said, I want you to get in an accident and blame me for it. Of course, you can't watch a video while you're driving. But I talk through the entire video so that they can hear me and what I'm doing through the entire uh, through the entire skill. So I talk myself through so they'll be hearing me doing the skill. So as they're driving to school, they, they can be listening to the video. And again, that auditory learning. I know many students are uh, visual learners or kinesthetic learners, but the audio learner uh, learning is valuable as well. Yeah, someone um, said, allowing downtime in the lab, Lakeisha, allowing downtime in the lab sets a precursor to learned behavior of downtime on the job, not 
good. Yes, know. yes, absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Yeah, so we're going to start wrapping things up, but did anyone have any other questions or comments or concerns that they wanted to share? Um, while you're typing those questions, those last minute questions in, um, Vicki and I will be doing another webinar um, on the 30th. So if you really liked this presentation, I highly recommend that you come to the next one. If you are already in the CNA School Business Building Mentorship Program, you are automatically going to gain um, free access to this webinar. So no worries. But if you are not in the mentorship program, um, then you will not gain access to it um, unless you sign up directly through the link that I just placed in the chat. So if you really like what you saw here today and you're interested in joining us again in the future uh, for something a little bit more specific, definitely uh, click that link and sign up so that you can join us. We would love to see you on September 30th as well. I've had fun. <laughs> I've had fun and I hope that the information is helpful and that it's going to have um, a positive effect on your pass rate, on your teaching and your students because isn't it wonderful when they get back to us and they say, I passed. Oh, I'm, I'm so excited for them. I think I'm more excited than they are. I'm so happy. Oh, no. <laughs> if you found this to be very, very helpful, type of one. If you felt like uh, this wasn't what I thought I was going to come see, type of two, that's helpful for us too. Uh, we would definitely want to evaluate ourselves to make sure that we're giving you what it is that you need and want. Okay, so let us know. One, if this is everything you needed it to be. Two, if it's not quite what you thought it was going to be. Let us know. And we've given our contact information. I also uploaded as a handout the PowerPoint and also a, an example of uh, a skills checkoff. And if you contact me, I might be able to help you with developing others. So, um, but Victoria might have that resource available as well. But, um, and I'm available for questions and you can email me. Uh, you can call me on my um, on the 800 line and then I'm going to go ahead and put my personal cell in here as well. All right, good. So it sounds like everyone is in agreement that this was very helpful for them. So that's good. I'm so happy that I'm able to prevent, provide value to you. That's the goal to be able to provide value to you that you can use something that is beneficial um, for you moving forward. All right, anything else you want to add, Vicki, before we wrap up? No, she just, uh, let's see, Rita's wanting to know how do, she, how do we get the uploads? Oh, uh, let's see. Let me see if I um, hide, download. I think you just click there on the handouts and then just download them. Yeah, there might be, a pool, there might be um, something that says handouts. I think at the very top, too, above the chat, I see where it says instructor resources or something. You might be able to click that, too. Let me make sure I've I made them available. Um, yes, yeah. there is a thing for the pro for the webinars that are associated with the mentorship program. If you're not in the mentorship program, yeah, it's a fifteen dollar fee. Okay. So the powerpoints though are available for uh, the participants, right? The handouts that I that I did are available for the participants. I see it there. I okay. see it there for me. Great, Melissa. Well, we look forward to seeing you on the 30th. Oh, great. I'm, I'm glad, Lakeisha. I'm glad you were able to download the handouts. And then Leticia wants to know, Victoria, what the fee for the uh, mentorship uh, program, uh, oh, for the mentorship webinar. Nothing. It's free. Oh, is it free? Or no, no there's, there's the one on the 30th. Yeah, the one on the, if, that's what I'm saying. If you're not, in, I think you were um, doing something so you didn't hear me. But yeah, if you are not in the mentorship program, the CNA School Business Building Mentorship Program, that webinar is $15. If you are in the program, then you will automatically be enrolled into that, um, that webinar with no fee. And that's only for the one on the 30th. There are certain ones that um, that add extra value to those who are in the mentorship program, and it, um, it adds value to them throughout their their process of building their CNA school. So um, those are very specific, and they, these are they, these people have already paid to even be in that program. So it's only right that anyone that is joining those type of webinars have to uh, pay a small fee as well to 
to be in that. Um, but yeah, if you click on the link, it gives you all the information about that webinar. Um, let's see. Yes, instructor resources. I'd love to see you guys on 930. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Um, Diana, I can't get them. Yeah, Lakeisha, do you want to share how you where you clicked to get those instructor resources? Because maybe it looks different on your screen. I see it at the top um, of the chat box on this end. I think that where you put the chat, I think there's a little bot, there's a little plus there uh, where you put type in your message and there to the left of that, there's a little plus, And I think that might be where you get them. Oh, it looks like two clouds at the top of the chat. Yes, it does. That's exactly what it looks like. Very good way to put it, Sade. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Sade. That's wonderful. Appreciate your help. Yep. All right. All right, guys. Well, you guys have a wonderful night. Thank you so much. We are so honored to uh, be able to, to work with you and give you this information, share this information. We're honored that you trust us with such, giving you such information. So thank you so much. Yes, I appreciate that, absolutely. I, I My goal in life is to die with no knowledge, to have given it all away and to share it as much as possible with anybody who wants it and can use it. That's my goal. I love that. <laughs> I think I've heard you say that before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a hospice nurse, so I'm not that afraid of death. So I'm comfortable with it. All right, everybody, have a good night. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.